In the sixth installment of the Gabriel's Inferno series, Julia deals with the aftermath of Gabriel's departure, while Gabriel goes on a journey of self-discovery. The movie picks up in the aftermath of the board's decision, they just assumed she was a victim of Gabriel's inappropriate harassment. Gabriel did not want this to shatter Julia's academic dreams, so he fell on the proverbial sword and took the blame for everything. Both Julia and Gabriel have been majorly affected by this. Julia believed that Gabriel no longer wanted anything to do with her, so she moved on with her life. Though it was painful for her to do so, with the help of her friends Rachel and Paul, she was able to pick up the pieces. She eventually graduated from the University of Toronto and moved to Boston to continue the rest of her educational career. Gabriel, on the other hand, was not doing so well. While Julia was thriving, Gabriel was trying to do some soul-searching. It led him back to Italy, where he stayed in Assisi and spent a whole lot of time helping those who were less fortunate than him. Doing all of this gave Gabriel a new purpose in life and the strength he needed to head back home to try and find Julia. Unbeknownst to Julia, Gabriel had never given up on their relationship. So, when they are reunited with each other, it's a shock. To say the least. The scene opens with Julia having dinner with Professor Picton who's asking her if she is satisfied with her thesis. Julia admits that she isn't, had she another year she would have done it much better. Picton is impressed, says that it's good she views it that way because students tend to think that they are far more talented than they actually are. She would be a better student and a better scholar with another year of hard work. Moving on with the dinner, Picton divulges that she doesn't like when people pry into her private life, so she too leaves others alone. In Julia's case she was dragged into something by David Harris. She isn't privy to everything that went on nor would she want to be. Julia will have a fresh start next year at Harvard and no one will have any inkling of what transpired here, but until then it will be wise of Julia to not draw any attention to herself. Female graduate students are vulnerable with respect to their reputations. It's best not to give anyone the slightest suspicion that she hasn't earned her accomplishments through hard work. Julia assures Professor Picton that she had worked very hard in the Dante seminar. Gabriel didn't help her with her essay or give her any special treatment. Picton believes her but is a little put off by Julia's deception of her. She understands why she wasn't brought into Julia's confidence, maybe Gabriel forbade it, she's annoyed with him too. But for reasons she wouldn't divulge there, she owes Gabriel a debt. At Paul's apartment he offers Julia to help with packing and moving after graduation. He will be heading back to Vermont after graduation, Julia can come along if she likes. Julia's dad will be helping her with the move and Paul extends the invite for him as well. They could meet his family, spend the day at his farm and then he'll drive them up to Boston. Julia shares that she won't be living in the university residence until August so she needs to find a place to reside in until then. Paul recalls his friend's brother being in Boston College, maybe he can help them find a place for her. Julia is touched by Paul's gesture especially after all that she had put him through in her quest with Gabriel. It's Julia's first time inside Paul's apartment. She notices a picture on the walls and Paul tells her that it's her sister and her husband alongside Paul's girlfriend from back home. She was working in Vermont and couldn't handle the long distance, they broke up a while ago. Julia visits Rachel in Philadelphia who has been swamped in her work along with making preparations for her upcoming nuptials. Julia hands her the keys to Gabriel's apartment saying that she would have mailed them to him but he isn't home, and no one knows when or if he will be back. Rachel curses him for breaking her friend's heart. She divulges that he has been in Selens Grove, a couple of weeks ago. He was at their parents' house, and one of the neighbors called their dad. Apparently he was up at all hours playing loud music and prowling around outside. Rachel cannot understand why he was doing this, he loves Julia and that kind of love just doesn't disappear overnight. Julia couldn't answer that either, maybe he just loved his job more. Or maybe he decided to go back to Paulina. Rachel finds that notion hilariously unlikely, surely Julia couldn't believe that. Julia is just about ready to believe anything at this point. Up until a year and a half ago they were still involved, she's familiar territory. Rachel doesn't agree. She exchanges their teas for something stronger as they settle in for a cozy girls' night. She assures Julia that in her honest opinion Gabriel would leave her just to keep his job. He would have gone up to her afterwards saying that he loves her but they have to wait. He loves Julia, she refuses to believe otherwise. By this point Julia is half drunk already. She slurs to Rachel that if Gabriel had loved her, he wouldn't have left her the way he did. The thought keeps creeping in though, what if he sleeps with Paulina? Rachel consoles her, Gabriel would do that and expect her to forgive him afterwards. Julia makes Rachel promise that if she finds out Gabriel has been with someone else, she would tell her. Gabriel is in Florence. His search of finding peace has flown him to that same hotel that he and Julia stayed at. He walks around the city wearing a wedding band in Julia's memory whose presence he feels at every corner he turns. He comes across the homeless man that Julia had insisted Gabriel should help. He walks up to the man and reminds him how his fiancée has helped him with money, and he had called her an angel. The man could not remember Julia, he tells Gabriel that there are many angels in Firenze, but more in a sissy. God favors the beggars there. Gabriel walks away handing him all the cash he had on him. Something about God's favor brings Gabriel to a sissy. While he is admiring the beautiful murals at the Basilica of San Francesco, Julia's silhouette catches his attention. 
He follows her down into the crypt where St. Francis lay to rest. The woman kneels at the altar and lights a candle to pray. Gabrielle follows her suit and kneels a couple of pews behind her. Once finished, the woman turns to leave, and to Gabrielle's dismay, it wasn't Julia, just some look-alike with similar features. In Toronto Julia is summoned by Dean Harris as her semester wraps up. He wanted to speak with her to find out whether she has had any other problems since the disciplinary hearing. Basically what he was wondering is if Julia has heard from Gabrielle. Julia couldn't reel in her snide comment, what did he care now? He's gotten what he wanted, Gabrielle's left. Dean Harris assures her that their meeting is to ensure that she has been able to receive an education without interference. Sighing, Julia divulges that Gabrielle has told her to stop contacting him and that it was over. Gabrielle sits at a laid-back cafe in a sissy eating his breakfast in peace when he is approached by a tourist looking for the Museum of Archaeology. He gives the man the directions that he requires. The man thanks him, sharing that he wanted to see it before he leaves along with his family for Florence where they'll be spending the next few months at the Franciscans, and will be volunteering at a medical clinic. Gesturing towards Gabriel, the man points that Franciscans can always use a little help. Caught off guard, Gabriel admits that he's not a Catholic. The man shrugs, neither was he, him and his family just wanted to lend a hand to good work. In a life-altering decision, Gabriel accompanies the man for his missionary work with the Franciscans in Florence. They take turns preparing meals and distributing clothes to those less fortunate. Gabriel finds himself gravitating towards the young children there, and much of his time goes by reading books to them and goofing around in the lush grounds. In his time there, he gets the medical clinic equipped with modern apparatuses. He makes it his point to see that the needy that get there are met with ease, their hunger satisfied, their bodies properly clad. He even funds the construction of a common bathroom that could cater to the increasing number of homeless people. When it's time to leave, the monks there are hesitant to let him go especially after the sizable donation that he's made to their cause. But Gabriel has got somewhere he needs to be. Flying back to Boston, Gabriel visits Maya's grave. After paying his respects to his beloved daughter, he calls her mother. He needed to see Paulina. That night Gabriel is visited by Grace in his dream. Gabriel hugs her as he confesses to regretting having never said goodbye. He never got to tell her how much he loved her. He should have been by her side when she passed on. Grace soothes him, just like she did when he was a boy. She assures him that she had always known his love. She wants him to stop blaming himself. She confides that although she loves all her children, Gabrielle had been her special gift from God. She tells him that there is someone that would like to meet him. And so Gabrielle is visited by a beautiful young girl. His daughter Maya. They talk for some time, about everything from Dante to her mother Paulina. Maya asks him if he loved her mother. It takes Gabrielle a moment to answer, he thinks that he does love her now in some way. As she gets up to leave, Maya tells Gabrielle how glad she is to get to meet him now, it was impossible before. Pointing at his tattoo, she tells him that he needs not to do that, she has always known he loves her. With assurance that she was happy where she was, a place filled with life, love and hope, Maya leaves Gabrielle. Meanwhile Julia has graduated and is set to move to Boston. She visits Professor Picton for a farewell dinner. Picton divulges that Professor Marinelli, a friend of hers at Harvard, is looking forward to meeting her. Of course it would be beneficial for Julia to meet other Dante specialists, in the area, especially at Boston University. She advises her to drop by the Department of Romance Studies at Boo. Julia thanks her for all that Picton has done for her, if it wasn't for her she didn't know where she would be standing now. As Julia bids her goodbye, Picton pulls her in a hug inviting to keep her updated via email every now and then. Julia along with her dad and Paul visit Paul's family in Vermont. She meets with Paul's ex-girlfriend, Allison, there. That night, Julia makes her way to the kitchen, she can't fall asleep. Paul is already there having some ice cream, he was out helping his dad with some farm stuff. He confesses to Julia that he does not want the two of them to say goodbye. Cupping her face in his hands, he tells her that he is in love with her, the thought of leaving her is ripping him apart. And he knows that she isn't in love with him but he urges her to ask herself if she could be, in time. He promises her a drama-free life where she would be treated respectfully and never left abandoned. He urges that he is constant, unlike Gabriel, unlike an inferno that blazes and dies out, she could be happy with him. And for a moment there, Julia could see this life he offered reeling behind her eyelids. Paul leans in to kiss her, and this time, Julia lets him. As they pull back Julia hugs him, the life he offered was indeed a compelling one but Julia's heart had long belonged to Gabriel. She apologizes for disappointing him but she could never reciprocate his feelings and he deserves to be with someone who loves him the way he loves her. They drive to Boston and Paul helps her unpack in her new apartment. He had even set up a job at the local coffee shop for her. As he turns to leave, Paul tells Julia about an email he has gotten from Professor Martin the day before. Professor Emerson has quit his job, he would still supervise Paul's dissertation. At least that's what Professor Martin has written. He thinks Martin is pissed, after all that he has put the department through he up and quits. Over the next few days Julia settles in her life at Boston, getting a hang of her job as a barista, and visiting the professors that Professor Picton has advised. She even made a couple of new friends. One stormy night, there's a power outage in her block as Julia is setting up her bookshelf. After lighting up some candles to illuminate the place, 
She gets back to the task at hand. While ruffling through her assorted collection, she comes across a book that had been placed in her letterbox back when she was in Toronto. Marriage in the Middle Ages, Love, Intimacy and Sacredness. The sender was unknown. Julia is filing through the pages when the index catches her attention and Gabrielle's last words to her come to mind. He had asked her to read Abelard's sixth letter, fourth paragraph. With shaky fingers, Julia finds the page and reads the fourth paragraph aloud. She also finds a photograph of Grace's apple orchard with a note from Gabrielle scribbled behind. He had written to his beloved that his heart is hers, just likewise his body, and soul. He will be true to his Beatrice as he intends to be her last. He had asked her to wait for him. With frenzied motion, Julia rushes out of her apartment in search of an internet connection. A flicker of movement in the trees across from her catches her eyes and she stops right in the middle of the road in pouring rain. It is Gabrielle. She is sure of it. She'd recognize that broad expanse of shoulders even if she goes blind. Two days to sense a speeding car heading her way, she is dragged off the road by Gabrielle. As the shock wears off, Julia demands to know what in the world was he doing there. Gabrielle tells her that he's come to her as soon as he could, right after handing in his resignation. Julia spits that she wouldn't know what to think when he fled without so much as a phone call, and then emailed her saying that it was over. Gabrielle explains that he'd sent her messages. Julia is livid, here he stands lying to her face about the calls he never made and the letters he never wrote. He had some nerve. Gabrielle reminds her about Abelard's letter to Helois and the photo of the orchard, the book he has put in her letterbox himself. Julia bites back that she hadn't known the textbook was from him, she only looked at it that night. Gabrielle couldn't believe her, he had told her to read Abelard's sixth letter. Julia reminds him he'd asked her to read his sixth letter. The thunder makes them jump out of their lover's quarrel, and Julia suggests that they head back inside her apartment. She does not want to accept him once again with open arms. It's been months since they have seen or heard from one another, and for Julia, it's like opening up an old wound. Gabrielle understands that in order to win Julia's heart back, he has to atone for the sins of his past. Gabrielle tells her that he had accepted the job as Dante specialist at Boston University. Julia asks if that means that he's here to stay. He admits that it wasn't the reaction he was hoping for, his staying is circumstantial. As he's a full professor now, Boston University wanted to be able to attract graduate students in Dante studies so they cross-appointed him with religion. It is surprising, a man who has spent his life running away from God would become a professor of religion. Julia asks him about the photo of her that he used to keep on his nightstand, she wanted to know if he had taken it with him. Gabriel nods his affirmation, he has wanted her to be with him, the photo was a poor substitute. Julia whispers his words back, letting them sink in to make them feel real. He wanted her. Hesitantly Gabriel's fingers graze her cheek. If only he had any idea of what it's like to be left by the person you love not once but twice. As Julia walks away from him, Gabriel stands up to leave, he's taken enough of her time. He urges her to let him have one more conversation with her before she decides to bid him a final goodbye. Irked, Julia dashes to her front door, holding it open for him, and asks him how Paulina was, or whether he had slept with her. Gabriel admits to having seen her just once all this time. He needed to ask for her forgiveness. The thought of sleeping with her never even crossed his mind. Paulina is in Minnesota with her family, she's met someone there. They agreed that Gabriel would no longer support her and Paulina wished him and Julia well. In Gabriel's mind, he confesses, he and Julia were still together. Julia repeats her question, finding it unbelievable that there wasn't any other woman all this time. Gabriel swears on Grace's memory that he had been faithful to her. He extends his hand, and this time, Julia puts her hand in his. She notices his wedding ring. Gabriel takes it off and offers her to read the inscription. I my beloved's and my beloved is mine. That ring has a mate. Gabriel had purchased them at Tiffany's in Toronto for Julia all those months back when she had told him who she was. Her voice breaking, Julia couldn't say more. After the last few months, this night is all too much. Gabriel whispers that they don't have to have this conversation now. If she could stand it, they could see each other tomorrow. Nodding her assent, Julia pulls him in for a tender kiss, filled with longing. With a last peck on her forehead, Gabriel professes his love for her and leaves. The next evening Julia gets to the address that Gabriel has left for her. It was a suburban house, quaint with picket fence and a cobalt blue front door. A note from Gabriel sticking on the door tells her to meet him out back in the garden. There is a teepee tent set up in the middle of the yard with soft, romantic accents of lace, pillows and throw blankets. His housekeeper is setting a table for two. She welcomes her with a smile then goes in to inform Gabriel. Gabriel greets Julia a good evening as he folds to kiss her hand. The tent, Julia points, is a lovely gesture but she'd rather have had a phone call from him three months ago. Gabriel seats them at the table and pours a glass of champagne for Julia alone. He was having sparkling water. When Julia asks him why water, Gabriel divulges that he has quit drinking altogether. Julia then inquires about his housekeeper as she brings their food. Gabriel introduces Becca as a wonder of New England industriousness. Once dinner is done, Gabriel leads Julia to the tent where they settle down for the talk. Julia begins by admitting to wanting to both hit and kiss him when he showed up at her apartment the night before. He had broken her heart, she had to go through therapy to move past it. 
It was only through Catherine Picton and Paul's kindness that she got through that. All of this could have been avoided had Gabriel only called. Gabriel couldn't talk to Julia. He divulges that Martin told him the dean would interview her prior to her graduation, and he would ask if she had heard from him. As lovely of a woman Julia is, she's a terrible liar. Gabriel couldn't risk it. He had to leave messages in code. Gabriel had thought that he could court Julia while she was her student and get away with it. He was wrong. His goal had always been to spare her from getting hurt. He screwed up when he graded Julia's paper himself rather than let Catherine do it. The administration had worried that Julia had gotten the grade by sleeping with Gabriel. They were going to suspend her grade while they investigated and as long as her grade was incomplete, she wouldn't be able to graduate, which meant no Harvard for Julia. Gabriel admits that it was his selfishness that led to all this mess, but she confessed she provided the corroboration the committee needed. Tears flowing down her face, Julia shakes her head. They had agreed to show a united front. With her future at stake, Gabriel couldn't just sit there and watch it happen. He agreed to their sanctions if they brought the investigation to a speedy conclusion. He promised them that he'd do anything. So they told him to end things with her and to cease all contact. And if he violated this condition, the agreement would be void, and they would reopen the investigation onto both of them. It dawns on Julia. That was why he had sent that one and only cruel email. Gabriel tells her that he'd send it from his university account to hers as a sign. He'd assumed she'd realize it was all for show. Jeremy Martin thought that if Gabriel would take a leave of absence he would convince Krista to drop the lawsuit, and he did. But he'd also said that if he found out that Gabriel was still seeing Julia he wouldn't lift a finger to help him. This was all too much information in too little time. Gabriel had been willing to risk his career to save hers, thinking that she might not forgive him. Gabriel sits there letting her absorb his side of the story. He tells her that he had sent her a text before that email, saying this was all temporary. He thought he was sending it to Julian H. Mitchell, but in his haste had sent it to Jeremy H. Martin who brought it to Gabriel's attention soon after. Julia couldn't hold the sobs any longer. Gabriel takes her in his arms and requests that she stays with him that night. They lay there in each other's embrace under the canopy of stars in the gentle summer breeze. For countless long nights, Julia has lain awake wishing Gabriel was with her. The next morning, Julia wakes up alone in the tent. She makes her way inside the house and is greeted by Becca who offers her a freshly made breakfast. They get into small talk and Becca tells her that with her own residence being in Norwood this is going to be an adjustment working with the professor, especially since he's a bit particular about his habits. But she's happy with it, given that he's lending her books. This is shocking for Julia, Gabriel never lends his stuff to other people, particularly not the books from his personal library. Looking around her, Julia also cannot fathom why he bought that house. Becca confides that it's the location and he plans to renovate and make it more comfortable. But he refuses to hire a contractor until he has Julia's approval. Gabriel walks in the kitchen just then, all relaxed and freshly showered. Kissing the top of Julia's head, he greets her a good morning. Julia expresses her need to take a shower and Gabriel directs him to the one and only bathroom in the house. He tells her that he's left some things for her in the vanity there. Gabriel and Julia sit at the table in the backyard, sipping lemonades. Julia confesses about having kissed Paul while Gabriel had been away. She assures him that it was more from Paul's end, to Julia it had merely been platonic. Gabriel has his own confession to make. He tells her how their days in Italy had been the happiest of his life, which is why he returned there for his time away from her. He even went to a sissy where he visited the basilica. He confides how her doppelganger had led him to the crypt where he was confronted by his sins. He had made an idol of Julia. He had told himself that he needed her to save him. Kneeling there he began to realize he'd been given chance after chance and through no goodness of his own, he'd been given love and grace. And he'd thrown it away. He realized Julia couldn't save him and then he found peace. His experience has caused him to focus on God but also to love her more. He admits to having thought that he knew what was good for them, good for her. He thought they had all the time in the world. He kneels before her, asking forgiveness for his wrongdoings, asking to assure him that he hasn't lost her forever. Julia pulls him in her embrace, she'd never stopped loving him. She'd hoped he would come back to her, that he still loved her. Kissing his chiseled jaw, Julia admits to wanting more than they had before. She admits to wanting to be his partner in every possible meaning of the term. The heat has turned up a notch as the two of them make their way up to the bedroom, with Gabrielle asking Julia to teach him what partnership she had in mind. He wants to have the chance to make things up to her, to treat her the way he should have treated her all along. Julia reminds him that he had always been generous in bed. Gabriel is quick to counter that might be so but he'd been selfish in other ways. Which is why he won't make love to her until he's regained her trust. As aching as he is to be with her, he wants her to know that he would never leave her, that he is hers and she is his alone. When he makes love to her this time, he wants to be her husband. Julia felt like she'd been doused in ice cold water then put back in a preheated oven. Did she catch that right? Sensing her shock, Gabriel elaborates how Richard had shown him the kind of man that he wants to be. He wants to make vows to her before God and stand in front of their families and make promises to her. Julia couldn't contemplate marrying him. She'd have to learn how to be with him again. In all honesty, she's still angry. Gabriel assures her that he has no intention of rushing her. In light of their last time together, he wants Julia to be sure that their union is born of love, 
and not lust, the next time they go to bed. When Julia persists that that particular goal could be realized without getting married, Gabrielle is forced to take a step back to reassess the situation. If she can't trust him enough to get married then maybe she should let him go. Julia counters back, asking if that's an ultimatum. For Gabrielle, he only intends to prove himself to her, but she needs time to heal. His arms had been full even when he was alone. If Julia were to tell him that she'd fallen in love with another, he'd let her go. Even though it would break him. He will love her forever, irrelevant to whether she loved him back. And that will be his heaven and his hell. They agree to put the matter aside until Rachel and Aaron's wedding and Gabrielle asks if she'd let him accompany her to it. Julia kisses her assent. Over the course of the weekend leading up to the wedding, Gabrielle and Julia get to the respective hotel. To her surprise her dad's already there. Gabrielle tells her that he's invited him, if he wants to marry her he needs to make amends with him soon. The three of them greet each other and Tom offers to find a quiet place at the bar, for he does not need an audience for what he has to say to Gabrielle. Julia reminds her dad to keep in mind that she loves both of them and would prefer no one getting injured here. Back in her room, she draws herself a bubble bath and sits there waiting for Gabrielle's call. He calls her, relaying how he'd given her dad a chance to curse him and call him a no-good cokehead who doesn't deserve his daughter. However, by the end of the conversation, he grudgingly offered to buy Gabrielle a domestic beer. The ceremony is beautiful, as whimsical as Rachel herself. They had made it a point to keep the celebration as simple as they could in lieu of Grace's passing. Gabrielle and Julia sit at a table with Julia holding the baby for Scott's girlfriend while the two of them dance. Watching her coo over the boy, Gabrielle comments that Julia would make beautiful babies. Julia is surprised to say the least, she thought his mind has always been set about not wanting children. Gabrielle sighs, if they were married, he confides to taking measures to have his vasectomy reversed. He doesn't know how successful the reversal might be but he'd like to try. He tells her about his time volunteering with the Franciscans at an orphanage in Florence. He'd found his niche there, telling stories about Dante in Italian. He confides that when Grace had found him, he was at an age which was considered unadoptable, but she wanted him anyway. Richard asks Julia for a dance, as they talk about the beautiful ceremony, and Gabrielle's toast to Grace, Richard expresses his conviction of how happy Grace would be now. The transformation that Gabrielle has gone through over the course of the year is extraordinary and they have Julia to be thankful for that. And he hopes that he'd have the chance to dance at another wedding with her in white. When Julia blushes, saying they're taking it one day at a time, Richard advises her not to take too long, as life has a way of taking unexpected turns, and one does not always have as much time as they think they have. The next morning as they leave for Boston, Julia accepts Gabrielle's proposal of marriage. At Selens Grove, Gabrielle has an elaborate teepee set up at their memorable apple orchard, the place where all of this began, to present Julia with the ring. It is an emotional moment as he places the ring on her finger, tears running freely down both of their cheeks. He promises her a life of love, light, hope and companionship. They decided on a quick wedding at the Basilica in Assisi. Their guest list isn't very long but Julia made sure that Catherine Picton is attending. The ceremony is simple yet beautiful, a true reflection of Julia's character. Her dad walks her down the aisle with their friends and family present to witness the union. At their honeymoon in Florence, Gabriel presents Julia with a surprise. He's bought a house for them. Their time in Florence has been so bewitching, he wanted to always have something to commemorate it. Early the next morning, Julia stands in the balcony, joining their room clad in only Gabrielle's shirt, and admiring the serenity of the vineyard that expanded before her eyes. Last night with Gabrielle had been everything and more than what she had hoped for. He's the most kind and compassionate lover. Gabrielle sneaks up from behind, covering her with a robe. Dressed like the way she was, she'd catch pneumonia and pass away. And he wouldn't want that. He's only just gotten accustomed to her again. He'd spent so long in the shadows, but now, he's looking forward to being in the light. With her.